beautifuls, this is Roman here, and welcome back to Cinderella Phenomenon. So, we are getting a step closer with Fraud. I know I keep saying this, but I feel like we are. And I kind of forgot what happened on yesterday's episode, because I'm recording a brand new day. So, yeah, let's get right to it. Later that day, as I am waiting outside the throne room for Emmy to finish one of our classes, two maids walk... Oh, now I remember. Ophelia was talking to us about our relationship with Rod. We have to be very careful because we're getting close with Rod and Emmy and people are noticing it. Two maids walk toward me and stop in front of me. Michiko, isn't it? What is it? I have already finished all my tasks for the day. Oh, I'm sure you have. Probably rushed through all of them so that you can hang around the prince and princess tonight. The head housekeeper has been giving you a lighter load so you can't afford the time to play around. Hmm? I blink at them confused. I have no idea what you are talking about. Don't play dumb. All the servants know that know what you've been doing. Just because you're Princess Emmy's personal maid doesn't make you better than the rest of us. I'd be careful not to get too big for your boots, Michiko. Well, first of all, I'm not wearing boots. Are you threatening me? What if we are? Then I'd be very disappointed in you. Oh, it's Emmy to the rescue! Yay! P Princess Emmy! Emmy moves to stand beside me, a disapproving expression on her face. I do not expect such petty cruelty from the two of you. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Your Highness, you really do have a talent for getting yourself into trouble. Rod, I, I didn't... At this time, I didn't do anything. I literally just stood there. Rod pauses briefly, his eyes meeting mine for a second before he looks at the maids. Don't you have better things to do than bully my sister's maid? We apologize, Your Highness. We'll be on our way. Okay, better apologize. The two maids run off. Emmy turns to look at me. Are you okay? I'm about to answer when I notice that Rod is abruptly walking away from us if Rod is back. He had only just started being nice to me and now he's back to acting as if I do not exist. What did I do? Emmy puts her hand on my back and gently pushes me forward. You wanted to ask him something, right? I could see it in your eyes. Emmy smiles as she pushes the door to the throne room open. I have a few more questions to ask my teacher. I'll be a while. But... But she, but she disappears into the throne room before I can finish. I glance down the hallway Broadway just, just disappeared down, and then back at the throne room. My thoughts whirl together in a vague mess until I make a decision. Or my decision. Wait! At the sound of my approaching footstep, Broad turns and looks at me. He scowls and does not say anything. As per usual, that's no... <laughs> um, tell him off for his behavior? I want to see what, what that leads to. The words spill out of me before I can even think on them. What have I done now to make you angry with me? Nothing. He turns away and I, and I glare as I follow closely behind him. You expect me to believe that? You can at least look at me when I'm talking to you. I reach out, to, reach out a hand to his elbow and pull him back so that he's facing me. Rod! But the words die in my throat when I see the expression on his face. Oh, So cute! His face is red and he refuses to look me in the eye. Ooh, I got it correct. My surprise causes me to release him. Rod quickly turns around and begins to walk away. I am left to stare dumbly after him. What is wrong with him? Normally, he is not so afraid to speak his mind. Sebi, please, please read his mind to us. I frown as I feel a dull ache throbbing somewhere deep in my chest. What is this? Why do I feel sad? Normally, Rod's distance does not make me feel like this. And yet now, am I really so sad that he does not want to speak with me? I shake my head and take a deep breath to still my mind. It is better not to think about it. Chapter 8, The Ball. Oh, crap, the ball is happening. <laughs> it is the day of the ball and I am waiting for Emmy to finish her last dance rehearsal. The lesson was over an hour ago, but Emmy remains here to continue practicing the steps. Meanwhile, I am preoccupied with thoughts of Rod's curse. I cannot believe that Rod traded his voice for a title, so the reason the king was able to find Ophelia was because of Rod. It is a little difficult to wrap my head around the implications, but one thing bothers me. Rod told me why he has the curse, but he, had, he gave no explanation as to how to break it. How did it go in the original fairy tale? Ami finishes up the last steps of her routine before walking over to me. I hand her the glass of water I was holding for, I was holding for her. Thank you, Michiko. Honestly, how did that end? Because, like, I watched, um... I did watch The Little Mermaid, but I don't quite remember it because I was so little. Even though my cousin made me watch it numerous times because I was his favorite princess. I honestly don't remember. <laughs> I mean, you must notice my curiosity because she stops to look at me quizzically. Is something the matter? 
I read a little bit of that fairy tale but never finished it. Can you tell me the whole story of the Little Mermaid? The Little Mermaid? But Emmy didn't get to finish it either. Right? Emmy takes a seat on the on one of the chairs bordering the throne room and gestures for me to take the op the one opposite her. Telling a fairy tale is always a good way to wind down. Once upon a time there was a mermaid that fell in love with a handsome prince. One day when she sworn so oh, sworn <laughs> swam to the surface of the ocean to find him, she saw that the prince was celebrating his birthday on the grandest ship in the kingdom. The little mermaid was captivated by the human party and stayed to watch. Then suddenly a violent storm hit the hit and the prince was thrown from the ship into the ocean. The Little Mermaid saved the prince and took him safely to shore, but she could not stay long. She eventually had to return to the ocean and leave him on land. This is similar to Viorca's rescue. The Little Mermaid was so in love with the prince that she went to see a witch who offered to trade her, po her a potion that would turn her mermaid's tail into legs. They struck a deal. The mermaid would sacrifice her beautiful voice for legs so that she could live with the prince on land. So in Rod's case, he traded away his voice to become a prince. However, the sea witch gave the little mermaid a warning and said that if she wasn't able to make the prince fall in love with her, there would be consequences. Consequences? Yes. Namely, if the prince fell in love and married someone else, the mermaid's heart would, be, would break and she would dissolve into sea foam. Hello? <laughs> I cannot help but recoil. My expression must be true or horror because Emmy quickly shakes her head. There's no need to be worried. Ron has said that his curse is different from the fairy tale. And you believe him? Emmy shrugs helplessly as she puts down her now empty glass of water. The fairy tale curse always twists the original fairy tale, right? Well, my fairy tale is backwards, though. Besides, it's not as if Rod traded his voice for legs, and... I've never heard of a cursed person that dies because they cannot break their curse. That may be true, but Emmy does not know what Rod traded his voice for. She does not know that he did it to become a prince for Riorica. Rod is already hiding things from her. Is it possible that Rod will die the day Viorica marries Desmond? I thought it was Desmond. Why is it Desmond? Desmond. <laughs> Forgot a letter. Later that day, I find Rod in the dining hall. He appears to be inspecting seat arrangements for the night's banquet. He glances up briefly to look at me before returning his attention to the place cards with the guest's name on them. What is it? I have been looking for you all morning. I'm distracted from what I am about to say when Rod, when I notice Rod switching the position of two place cards. I frown as I cast your name on one of them. He's moving Viorica's place at the table. He's trying to make sure she sits as far, far away from him as possible. Surely you have better things to do than stay in here. What happens if you cannot break your curse? Rod's movements stutter before he shakes his head sharply. That is something you do not need to know. Oh, uh, yes I do, because I am very much in love with you. Get angry at him. I know that's wrong though, right? Rod's coldness grates, me, grates at me and I find myself snapping at him. What is wrong with you? Excuse me? All I'm trying to, all I'm doing is trying to help you break your curse, but you're acting as if I'm trying to help you, if my trying to help you will only make things worse. No, I'm only insisting that I don't need your help. We are partners, Rod. I know that doesn't seem to mean much to you, but it means something to me. I intentionally softened my tone when I realized I had been shouting at him. You should let me help you. What for? Just because you've somehow managed to get two good deeds on your own doesn't mean you can help me at all, Michiko. Frustration courses through me as I clench my hands into fists. Why must he be so stubborn? It is so certain that I will not be able to help him at all. Emmy told me the story of the little mermaid. She said that the mermaid dies if the prince marries someone else. Rod, when Viorica marries Desimon, will you... <coughs> okay. My voice trills off when I hear the sound of the door behind us. Is it Ophelia or the king? I rushes forward and grabs me before I glance back at the door. Ow! I become aware of, weight, of a weight holding me down to the floor. The impact of the ground against my head blurs my vision, making it impossible for me to see what is happening at first. Am I underneath the dining table? I struggle to try to try and sit up, but the weight pushes me down, uh, down, pushes down on me again, forcing me to be still, quiet. Rod, why did it push me underneath the table? I am about to ask him aloud when the sound of footsteps silences me. I cannot help but remember what Sir Mithros was saying about rumors. If Rod and I were seen alone together by the servants, the rumors will no doubt get worse. But why is Rod doing this? I stay quiet as the people that enter the dining hall begin to talk. How strange for this place to be empty at this time of day. There's a pause and then another voice speaks up. You better have, a good, you better have good news for me, Mithros. Okay, I chose wrong, obviously. Let's load it back up. Plead him? Plead with him? I don't want to plead. Something aches deep in my chest at, at Rod's coldness. Please. 
Oh, oh, he's shocked that I asked. Okay, that is very right. Brad startles so strongly that he almost drops the place card he's holding. Please tell me. We have been partners for months now. But I've barely... Yes, I know that it's... I know that it is an unusual partnership. And that most of our helping each other has been sub... Su subtle? But... I'm only one good deed away from breaking my curse, while you seem to have seem to be no closer to breaking your curse than when we started. I will do whatever I can to help you with your curse, Brad. So please let me help you. Oh. Silence falls. Moments later, Rod sighs and looks away from me. Some unspeakably sad emotion shines through his eyes. Even if I wanted your help, Michiko, there's nothing you can do. Dread settles in the pit of my stomach at Rod's words. Could I be right? Will Rod actually die if he does not manage to break his curse? Oh, well, let's, not, let's hope that doesn't happen. Sir Alcaster and Sir Mithras. Rod's hand tightened on my shoulders. Everything is as you requested, Sir Alcaster. There should be no issues. There better not be. You've disappointed me before, Mithras. I will be careful not to try my patience again. Yes, Sir Alcaster. Sir Mithras sounds oddly subservient. Sub subservient? Sub what? But why? The two of them are both ranked equally, and neither of them should have to answer to anyone other than the king. Unless Sir Alcaster truly is the witch and is forcing Sir Mithras to obey him with a spell. Wait a few minutes after I leave. We should not be seen together. I do not hear Sir Mithras respond, but I can hear Sir M Alcaster leaving the room. Sir Mithras sighs out, but is otherwise silent when he leaves the room after a few moments. I exhale fully as the door finally closes behind Sir Mithras. This is bad. I was so engrossed in Sir Alcaster and Sir Mithras' conversation that I, was on I only just now realized that Rod is hovering over me. Oh, he's so cute! Oh, hi, Sebby. Sebby's just watching. Hey, are you alright? Are you hurt? You look a little... Rat suddenly pauses as he notices our positions. He stares at me for a few moments, eyes wide. He scrambles out from underneath the dining table, and by the time I do the same, he's standing far away from me, his gaze fixed on the wall. He is bright red. It would be funny if I weren't sure I was the same color. Rat clears his throat. It seems that Sir Alcaster really is the witch if he has the ability to make Sir Mithras obey him. Lady Parfait should be told immediately. Rod turns on his heel to leave the dining room. Rod, wait! What? This is urgent, princess. I can't just... He called me princess. You called me princess. I don't think you've ever called me princess. Why am I not freaking out about this right now? Why is she so worried? When Vorica marries Desimon, will you die? Oh. That's a better question, I guess. Rod pauses for a moment, but I can tell from his pained expression that he will not speak. You're running out of time, Rod. My eyes flip between Sebi and Rod. What does that mean? Nothing. He turns away from me once again and starts walking away. Rod. There must be something in my voice that makes Rod stop because he turns to look at me. Please stop running away from this. What would knowing the answer achieve, Michika? Though Rod's wor words are harsh, his tone is soft. There's nothing anyone can do. Leave it alone, Michiko. It's for the best. But I've already fallen in love with you. I could at least tell you that before you die, right? That so won't do anything but make you feel guilty, but, you know... <laughs> as long as you know someone did love you. I cannot help but get mad at Rod's dismissive tone. I move toward him, frowning. How can you say something like that? You're not the only person that would be affected if you keep refusing to do anything to break your curse. Can you imagine what your death would do to your sister? To your mother. Losing you would destroy them. Rod's face is suddenly inches away from mine. He places his hand to the walls behind me, caging me in. His face is flushed with anger, but the look in his eyes is tormented. My family has been dealing with the consequences of my actions for the majority of my life. They don't think that I don't know what effect my curse has on the people closest to me. Besides, I... I don't want to involve you in this too. Oh, Too bad. Too late. His voice is a whisper, but I can still hear his words. Rod, why can't I just tell him? I have feelings for you. <laughs> Rod pushes away from me and stalks off as I stare after him. It says that, but then he does—he still does nothing to try and break his curse. I do not understand him at all. What is stopping him? I don't know. I don't know, honestly. Let's ask him. <laughs> Rod is absent from the palace for the rest of the day and returns only once the sun has set to prepare for the ball. Oh, right, the ball is today. I forgot. I'm not... Or, Sometime soon, is it today? I have not been able to talk to him since, but I assume that he has been to the march in the Tell Dralor and Parfait about our suspicions of Sir Alcaster being a witch. I hope they come up with an effective plan for dealing with him. The palace is not safe so long as he is here. 
The ball is just about to start that evening and I have been asked to make sure none of the guests are lost or wandering the hallways. I've been walking around for a while, directing any late guests in the right direction. That should be everyone. But as I turn the corner, I notice two people lingering by a column. Excuse me, the throne room is... I pause when I look more closely at the two men in front of me. I recognize one of them instantly. Oh. What is Sir Alcaster doing outside of the throne room? And who is that man he's with? Ah, Michiko. Sir Alcaster gestures me toward him and I approach warily. This is Varg. He is one of the guests for the ball. Varg sweeps aside his cape as he bows, and I curtsy and dip my head to hide my expression. I have not heard of a Varg, and why would he be bowing to a mere maid? Also, why is he wearing such an elaborate costume and mask? This is not a masquerade ball. If Varg is an acquaintance of Sir Alcaster, there is no telling what or who he truly is. Varg is one of the suitors for Princess Emmy. Would you please escort him to the throne room? I will be along shortly. Varg Varg's politeness is even more suspicious. Of course, Sir Alcaster. I meet Varg's gaze briefly and cannot help but frown at the way he is smirking at me. This way. Ugh. Varg and I make our way toward the throne room. I cannot help but feel wary of the fact that he is falling behind me where I cannot see him. The maids are this lovely, the princess must be truly beautiful. Varg laughs and I grip my teeth at the sound. What? It was meant as a compliment. There's no need to look at me like that. Varg looks at me curiously. Hmm, our maid's not allowed to speak in this place. I have nothing to say. Not the most cheerful person on staff, are you? Thankfully, the doors to the throne room appear as soon as we turn our corner, and I do not have to come up with a, with a response to his words. Right here. I gesture toward the throne room and move to leave, but Varg's voice stops me. You should at least very- uh, you should at least- uh, what? You should at the very least escort me inside and introduce me to the princess, don't you think? Isn't that what a maid should do? Technically, that is the announcer's job. But Varg came so late, he probably already missed the introductions. I wouldn't want to think badly of any servant- any of the servants at the palace. I took a deep breath of, to calm my- calm myself down before turning toward the door. Follow me. I can tell the moment I step into the room that the official introductions have already passed. Most of the guests have already be begun to mingle and scatter across the throne room as the band sets up. No one notices when I walk into the throne room in front of Varg. I do not trust Varg, not if he is associated with Sir Alcaster. I might have time to warn someone about him while he is distracted, but who? I would warn... Rod, but is that wrong? I feel like it's wrong. My eyes fall on Rod. I notice that he's leaning against one of the walls, away from the crowds. I head directly for him, moving quickly so that Varg is not right behind me. Rod! Rod frowns at me as I come to stand in front of him. What? There is a man here called Varg. I think Sir Alcaster brought him. Sir Alcaster. Apparently Varg is one of the suitors for Emmy's hand. Rod glances past me at Varg, his eyes narrowed. Is that him? Is that Varg? When I turn back and follow his line of sight, I almost gasp with shock. Varg has been over... Oh, maybe I should have worn Emmy. Spent over one of Emmy's hand, clearly having just pressed a kiss to the back of it. We should have kept him away from M. But, Rod and I are not too far away, so we can hear him clearly. But the throne room is already hushed at the sight of the crown princess being so boldly directly addressed. May I have the first dance, your highness? I feel sick, but I cannot bring myself to say anything more as Emmy puts her hand in Varg's. I accept Lord Varg. The moment Emmy makes her way to the center of the dance floor, a man signals to the band and the musicians start playing. This feels wrong. I can only nod as I watch Varg pull Emmy closer. At first it's just he and Emmy dancing, but then the other couples gradually trickle in to join them. I do not like this at all. Rod and I watch in silence as the first dance continues on. I know for a fact that Rod must see the dreamy smile on Emmy's face as certainly as I can. When the music stops, both of us move as one toward Emmy. Even though the dance is over and Varg has released her, they still stand close together in the center of the room. The silence is interrupted when the double doors open and Sir Alcaster, along with two knights, stalk in the center of the room where Emmy and Varg stand. Their arrival causes an uneasy stir in the crowds. The king rises from his throne, eyebrows drawn. Alcaster, is there some kind of disturbance? Alright, that was wrong. Obviously, I should have went to Emmy. Warn Emmy. My attention is quickly drawn to where Emmy is moving between groups of people, introducing herself and making light conversation. I know this will be frowned upon, but Emmy's safety must come first. I make my way quickly over to Emmy, curtsy it just off to the side, trying to draw as little attention to myself as possible. Princess Emmy, may I have a word? Emmy is clearly shocked at my intrusion, but she masks it well. Excuse me, it appears my maid has something for me. I draw her closer, 
closer to the walls where the crowd blocks us from view. I wasn't expecting you to be here, Michiko. Not that I mind, but won't you get in trouble? There is no time for that. I take her hand in mine and look at her somberly. You have to watch out for this man in a mask. Sir Alcaster brought him to the ball. Why should I be worried then? I cannot exactly tell her that I think he's a witch right now. There are too many people looking. Just please be wary of him. I'm sure there's nothing to be worried about from anyone here, Michiko, especially if Sir Alcaster is involved. On the contrary, if Sir Alcaster is involved, I would also recommend staying on your guard, Emmy. Rod? I turn in shock to see Rod suddenly standing beside me. Oh, okay. You should trust Michiko. Excuse me. I jump back at the sound of Varg's voice. Rod takes a step forward and places his hand on my shoulder to steady me. I don't believe we've been introduced. Varg looks at me for a few moments, but I say nothing. He eventually turns to Emmy, a wolfish smile on his face. That is totally Fritz, because Fritz, I believe, has the red riding hood. Um, one, because that's obviously the only one left. Peter Pan star is for Waltz. So, I'm pretty sure this is Fritz. He just doesn't realize he has a bad side to him. <laughs> My name is Varg, and you must be Princess Emmy. The tales of your beauty did not do you justice. Emmy flushes as Varg reaches for her hand. He presses a kiss to the back of it, still grinning. I can feel Rod tense behind me. I have the first dance. Emmy bites down on her lower lip as she stares at him. I become acutely aware of just how quiet the throne room has become. She cannot refuse him with so many people watching her. That sucks. Alcaster says nothing as the knights station around the room, approach Emmy and Varg and stand around them, encircling them. Emmy's expression shifts from confusion to fear. The crowd becomes even more anxious. Alcaster, explain this! Alcaster briefly glances at him but says nothing. He turns back to his knights and snaps his fingers. The knight pull out their swords and point them at Emmy. Em! What's going- what the hell? I reach out to grab Rod's hand before he can make his way toward her. Rod, it, it is too dangerous. I know, but- Thoughtless actions can have actions have potential to put Emmy in even more danger. Rod's only response is to tighten his grip on my hand. I place my other hand over to over his to reassure him, and slowly but surely his grip begins to loosen. I turn my gaze back to the king. Alcaster, stop this immediately! What do you think you are doing? Something I should have done a long time ago. I have been nothing but loyal to this kingdom, and all I have ever wanted was for Angeli to thrive. But ever since the queen died, this kingdom has become weak. It is because you are a weak ruler, Gennaro. Gennaro? Gennaro? What? The people were very productive back then, more disciplined during the late queen's reign. Though the kingdom has become less productive without fear to drive them. When there is power, there is order. Power is not something that should be needlessly used to control people. It is used to protect them. You of all people should know that. Sir Alcaster shakes his head. I, of all people, know that order is what make a hierarchy stronger. I am only doing what is necessary. I am re reorganizing the system. Hand over the crown, Gennaro. Gennaro, Gennaro? Sir Alcaster turns his head to Varg, who remains standing beside a scared Emmy. You will, be, you will obey me if you do not want your precious daughter harmed. Please leave my daughter out of this. Emmy steps back, her eyes now brimming with tears. Varg sees the princess. The princess. As soon as Sir Alcaster gives the order, Rod immediately lets go of my hand and rushes towards his sister. Rod, no, wait, bro. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I quickly follow after him, but Rod suddenly stops in his track. I bump abruptly into his back. Rod? Varg! Sir Alcaster's booming voice echoes around the room, which has suddenly gone eerily silent. My eyes move to Varg, but he's standing motionless. What is happening? Finally, Varg smirks. He steps to the side, standing in front of Emmy as if to block her from view. Sir Varg, you must be delusional, old man. I'm not letting you anywhere near the princess. The knight's next movement are a blur as they rush at Sir Alcaster. In mere moments, he has been disarmed and pinned to the ground. Several more knights have also appeared from behind to surround Sir Alcaster. A man emerges from in between the circle of knights. He moves to stand beside Varg and Emmy. Sir Mithras looks at Sir Alcaster disdainfully. What is the meaning of this, Mithras? We had a deal. The anger, ang anger is now pal palpable pal in Sir Al Alcaster's flushed face. Did we now? Mithras, explain yourself. Sir Mithras drops to one knee in front of the king. Of course, your majesty. He raises his head slightly to look at the king. I have known for a long while that the man you see before you is a traitor. I was even aware of his plans, but I could not tell you of them without any evidence. Two of your knights had tried to inform you of these plans before, but we all looked down on them with disdain. I had to make sure that I did not come 
unprepared like they did. Oh. Jurian and Garland. What? Both of them knew of Sir Alcaster's plans? What was that the reason why they were dishonorably discharged for false ac accusations? I knew enough of his plans that I could thwart, thwart it. This is why I thought the best way to reveal his dastardly ways was to craft a fake alliance with him. Sir Varg and I have been working together to unravel Alcaster's plans, Your Majesty. Varg is an invaluable accomplice. Wait, so Sir Mithras has been pretending to work with Sir Alcaster this whole time? And so we arrive at the events of tonight. I apologize for undertaking this task without seeking your counsel, Sir y Your Majesty. But I could think of no better way to end this madness once and for all. You flying snake! Sir Mithras stands and turns to Alcaster, he gestures at him dismissively. Seize him. The knight's next movements are a blur. The men rush to Sir Alcaster all at once and in mere moments Sir Alcaster has been disarmed and is now pinned to the ground. Isn't Sir Alcaster a witch? Why is he not using his magic? Mithras, I am indebted to you for saving us. The whole kingdom is. I only did what was necessary, your majesty. The king's glances at the knights, then at Sir Alcaster, his gaze steely. Take him away. Sir Alcaster struggles uselessly against the knights as they drag him away. He is nearly out the door when he starts screaming at the king. Gennaro, you fool! You, that man is a witch! You, a snake! I, you, you cannot trust him! No, Alcaster, I was wrong to put my trust in you. Even as Sir Alcaster is pulled from the room, we can hear him babbling in the hallways about a witch. Sir Alcaster never used any magic to escape. Was he truly not a witch? Are you alright, princess? I am pulled from my thoughts when I hear Varg's voice. He is now trying to comfort a shaken Emmy. For a few moments, he looks away and his eyes meet mine. He smiles, but it is fleeting, and moments later, his attention is back on Emmy. Weird. The ball comes to an abrupt end after Alcaster's stunt. He is thrown into a jail cell and promised a trial after a few days. Time, where he will be tried for treason against the kingdom. Still can't believe Sir Alcaster would do something like that, and so brazenly too. I wonder, what happened to Sir Fitzgerald? They say he vanished completely last night. Do you... You think he was working with his father? No, he is Varg. <laughs> he is Varg. I've said it before in the very beginning when I first saw that guy's character. I was like, that looks like Fritz. The truth is, I have no idea what to think. I had thought that I had, e I had everything figured out, but now I've become more and more confused by the moment. Fritz was always a little to a fault, but then Sir Alcaster was the same way with the king, and I have not seen or heard of Fritz for weeks. I cannot really say. Ah, good morning, Princess Emmy. Sir Varg. Varg was offered a room at the palace for a few days' visit. He is being treated as M Sir Mithras's valued guest. I have heard from the other servants that he is Sir Mithras's relative who lives in a neighboring kingdom. I don't think so. I hope that you are feeling well now, princess. Y yes thank you for your, your help last night. Is that me? Blushing? I know I won't be here long, but I do hope to get to know you better during the duration of my stay. I would love that. Then I'm looking forward to spending more time with you. Oh, I forgot that I'm meant to be in my mother's room right now. Michiko, Sir Varg, I'll see you both later. I curtsy as Emmy walks off, leaving me alone with Varg. I cannot help but feel uneasy in his presence. Something about him puts me on edge. He makes me feel uncomfortable. Excuse me, I have errands to attend to. Wait! Before you head out, I have something to give you. Give me? Varg reaches into one of his pockets and withdraws the letter that he holds out to me. Uh, what is this about? Hmm, well, I guess you'll have to open it to find out, princess. You're Fritz! <laughs> I, j why did you freak out when, um, Rod called me princess? He's never called me that. My blood turns to ice in my veins. He knows I am the princess. That could only mean that he is... I have no idea what you're talking about. Excuse me. I am about to leave when Varg selling grabs my wrist. The play is just about to start, princess. You have a responsibility as a main character to perform impeccably until the very end. Otherwise, well... He grins at me. Is the same wolfish... Yeah, this is totally him. Wolfish smile that he flashed at me during the ball. You might miss out on your fairy tale ending. What? Before I can say anything else, I feel a hand grab my other arm. Someone tugs me back and away from Varg, then comes to stand in front of me. Stay away from her! Rod? Varg looks at Rod, then at me, his smile growing more crooked. What an interesting turn of events. I wonder how this will end for the both of you. T 
Tell me, Michiko, what is he to you? He ain't a friend! No, he's not. He's more than a friend. But we have to stop here. And I'm very triggered. Because I want to play more. But I also have to go to work. <laughs> so anyway, thank you guys for watching. Stay beautiful. And I'll see you guys in the next one.